I'm delighted to be here at this, the first meeting of DH Benelux. I'm delighted to see so many of you here. When I first started going to Digital Humanities Conferences, they weren't even called that then, they were called ALLC, ACH, Joint Meetings. Um, there was about 100 people around the world getting together. So this was only 15 years ago there was like 100 people doing Digital Humanities. One of the things I want to talk about now is about the size of communities and the benefits of communities and the benefit of getting to know your local community in Digital Humanities and the strengths that that can bring. Now, 15 years ago, the 100 people around the world doing digital humanities were the local community because there was only 100 of us doing that. Now, this year, I am chair of, for my sins, I am program chair for the Digital Humanities Conference in Lausanne in a few weeks' time. And there were over 800 applicants, to the, or 800 papers submitted to that conference from 2,500 scholars. So there's been a huge growth of the field. So what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about the growth of digital humanities over the past 10 years in particular and then talk about what my view is on the benefits of having a, and the strengths of having a local organisation. The kind of things that you can do for strength and numbers joining together in DH Benelux. And I'm going to pick, perhaps a little bit unfairly, on um, the website that you have up, um, Digital Humanities Benelux Conference, a conference that showcases the state of the art in digital humanities, the most recent development in humanities research. I thought that was quite interesting, the most recent development in humanities research. I'm also going to show that we have a long trajectory and a long history in digital humanities. So what we are doing now is responding to certain changes in technology now, but actually we are embedded into a much longer tradition. So the term digital humanities, as we all know, and I am aware I am preaching to the crowd for all of this, um, the term really became popular in 2004 with the launch of this book, A Companion to Digital Humanities. The term had been about a few times before this, there were a few job adverts which asked for someone, a specialist in digital humanities. If you look up Google Books and you look up digital humanities in Google Books, there are a few mentions of it beforehand. But the, this publication of this text with this new phrase, digital humanities, really put it into the conscience that this is what we do when we use computers in the arts, humanities and cultural and heritage. We shall call it digital humanities. It gave it a stamp, it gave it a brand. Um, and digital humanities does various things. The, I'm going to show you some examples of just some of the stuff that I do to get a flavour of it. Um, the most obvious one, of course, is taking documents, counting words, looking for trends, and there are more and more sophisticated methods to do that. So this is a really simple look at a million, abs a million words of abstracts from LLC ACH conferences up to 2005, just before it changed its name to the Digital Humanities Conference, and we can see how everyone starts talking about XML and people don't talk about SGML anymore. You know, we can count things. But we, we do much, much more sophisticated text analysis now, and we do things like build tools. So we have built a tool recently, an iPhone app called Texto, which takes text and allows you to visualise text, especially on social media, and then do basic text analysis on that, trying to open up text analysis to the masses. But a lot of my work is on image processing and this isn't actually a big area in the digital humanities. There's only a few of us really doing a lot of work on image processing and it sits between digital humanities and heritage science and that's okay. That's kind of where I hang out with engineers and computing scientists looking at heritage stuff. We've worked on things like documents from Hadrian's Wall, removing wood grain, I work on burnt and uh, manuscripts, so this is a manuscript from uh, 1639 from Northern Ireland which was burnt in a fire in London in 1735 and it's now buckled from manuscripts when the uh, manuscript material when it gets heated up, it denatures and so it kind of buckles up and what we've been doing with this is we build a virtual model of it and then once we've built the model we can unfurl it and we can actually un the, the video for this is amazing, by the way. Go onto the Great Parchment Book WordPress and look at the video of how we stretched it all out and digitised it and then can actually now read these things. Um, and if you're going to scan small items, you might as well scan big items. So um, this is the Science Museum in London. We went into the shipping gallery with our lasers for a week and we scanned in this whole shipping gallery. It's about the size of three football pitches before it got dismantled. Um, and we have built a seven terabyte model uh, that 
you can zoom right into even the, the, the labels on the items and see what they are. And we can still walk about this gallery even though it has been dismantled. Um, the question for that then is, what do we do with this? What do we do with these models once we've made them? What does it mean to be making these models? What does it mean to be taking texts and turning them inside out and analysing them? What does it mean to have a 7 terabyte model that sits on a hard drive somewhere and you can use to do what? And it's quest these questions about what and why and why you would bother kind of interests me. We also study users, users of digital humanities or users of digital resources in the humanities. So a lot of people wouldn't call themselves digital humanists. These are people that use collections databases or use digital resources, digitized resources. We want to study how people are using digitized resources so we know how to make them. So this is a graph from uh, the British Museum. We studied how people were using the British Museum catalogue to look at their digitized items so that we could then inform the, the British Museum on best practice on how they could <laughs> deliver digital content. And sometimes we make stuff, we launch it, we test it, and then we report it back. And this, I guess this is actually one of my favourite type of projects, where we go, yeah, let's try something, and we try and test it and see how it works. So it's a whole life cycle then. And this is Transcribe Bentham, which was mentioned previously. It's a crowdsourcing project where we've put the manuscripts of the philosopher Jeremy Bentham online, and we've asked for help for people to help down, um, transcribe them. We are now, it's three years this project's been going for, and we've hit nearly four million words of volunteer transcribed labour. And we've now showed it's an economical way to do this. It's cheaper than getting research assistants to do it in the long run. You have some start-up costs to build the model and to build the system. But once you get that, eventually, four years down the line, it's now paying for itself, and it's much faster. So I like doing these projects because we're, we're having an idea. We're, we're taking something like crowdsourcing, which exists, as a kind of internet technology or an approach on, to internet technologies, we drag it back into the arts and humanities, we implement something, we see if it works, and in the case of Transcribe Bentham, it worked yay, sometimes things don't work, but that's okay too. Here's another successful project we've, we've done which is called Curator, where we put iPads into our zoology museum at UCL <laughs> and we put six different displays up and they ask really tricky ethical questions about the museum. So we have lots of things in pickle jars and dead things. Um, and then we ask the, eth <coughs> the ethics and we ask the visitors what they think about this. Um, already when I kind of I say that it sounds like you know putting iPads in museums, Ooh, but this was four years ago that we launched this, just when iPads came out, like within two months of iPads actually coming out, we had this in the museum and it was a really kind of novel way of, of and a cheap way of being able to interact with their museums and it showed the curators of the museums a lot, it told them a lot about what their users want and their opinions. So that's another example where we're having an idea, yay, iPads, relatively cheap, what can we do with this? Oh, we could put them in our museum, we could do this, we could learn more, and we build it, we implement it, we test it. Recent developments in humanities research, and I wouldn't like to pretend that I do everything in digital humanities. I do work with a huge team of people, and some are doing other stuff, which I, I personally don't do, such as maps and GIS, and there's a huge movement now in digital humanities into doing mapping. This is from one of my PhD students, Paul Gooding, and it's a map which shows who is allowed to see the digitised newspapers in the British Library, depending on where you live. And it depends on your local authority in the UK paying the money for the subscription database. Um, and the interesting thing, so if you're in the green areas, you're, you can see the digitised heritage content. If you're in the red areas, you can. And the interesting thing on this is it directly maps onto the poverty map in the UK. So if you live in an area of, of where you're poor, and lots of people are in social housing, and lots of kids have free school meals and all that, you also are information poor, and you can't see digitised resources because of the way that things are set up. So this is kind of interesting to talk about digitisation and stuff like that. So, and, and mapping is an enormously powerful way of, of demonstrating data. I, I don't do much social network analysis, but my PhD students do. This is a, um, one of my PhD students, Rudolf Allen, who looked at the blogosphere and, and who invented blogging in 1998. And he looked at 10,000 different Usenet postings and he showed who was talking to who then. And he proved that the histories of blogging, which came out a few years ago, were all wrong. Everyone's forgotten actually who was talking to and who was responsible for these platforms. And he did that by building up this kind of social network analysis. 
or we can do modern social network analysis. So this is from a, that camp in France last year, and we can see who is talking to who online and what that means. So this is a very popular way of um, capturing conferences. So I hope someone here is capturing all the tweets from this conference and we'll be able to see that, you know, who are the mover and shakers on, on social media for, for a DH balance. And of course there's big data. Big data. It's going to solve all our problems, haven't you heard? It's brilliant. And um, we're doing an interesting thing just now. With the, we're just starting a project with the British Library, with the computing science students, the British Library Digital Datasets, High Performance Computing at UCL, UCL Centre for Digital Humanities, and we're all kind of mucking in for three months to try and build some tools which will allow us to deliver some of the British Library content to people. So when you go to the British Library and go, give me every single book written in 1820 that is about medicine that was published in London you can download the data set, not just see the records. So we're trying to build these kind of things and, and help people search things more um, you know, effectively. So that's just an example of the kind of things which are going on in digital humanities just now, and the kind of state-of-the-art stuff in digital humanities, the most recent development in humanities research. But I want to go back to this idea about digital humanities being new. The first thing about digital humanities is, uh, to get things onto a computer, you must have to quantify them. They must be in some type of numerical form so that the computer can analyse it and transform it. And the important thing to know about that is doing numerical analysis in the humanities is not a new thing. So here I have a book, this is one of the earliest books in UCL Special Collections, which is a concordance. So as soon as books were printed, people were trying to dismantle them and analyse them to count words, to build indexes, to build concordances. They did this manually, it took a long time, but the stuff that we're doing now is based on this trajectory that goes back nearly 600 years. People have, have since the founding of humanity schools, people have been doing quantifiable methods. So this is one of the easiest examples, counting words. I showed you this first slide of what I do, counting words in the conference abstracts. This is exactly the same. We're counting all the words in the Bible. We're showing how many times they say the word abomination. We're learning something about the Bible from that. It's part of a trajectory that goes back 600 years. But it's not just for words. This is Joseph Scaliger. And what he did was look at the history of humankind from the written record. This was back in 1610. And he showed that the ancient Egyptians had to be alive before the events in the Old Testament. So before the Old Testament, even though that was supposed to be the creation of the world, he proved through the historical record that the ancient Egyptians lived before that. He got into huge amounts of trouble for that then, huge amounts. But he did that through quantifiable methods, from taking the data through analysing it. Again, using quantifiable methods in the humanities, nothing new, a history that goes back 500 years. A more modern example of this, August Schleicher wrote, did a study, The Languages of Europe in Systematic Perspective in 1850, and he this was looking at linguistic data, systematic, quantifiable looking at uh, linguistic data, and he showed that all the European languages had a common root, a pure root. Now, this again caused another type of huge amount of trouble across Europe in the 20th century, this idea that there being a pure root for, for European history. But the point I'm making here is that all of these things are quantifiable methods in the humanities. They're examples of the types of things we do now in digital humanities, but they just couldn't do quite enough because they had to do them manually. So what we're doing is just better, faster, more, but actually it's part of a trajectory that goes back quite a long way. The other thing to say about these three examples, they're all available from UCL Special Collections. I didn't have to go to UCL Special Collections to get them because, yay, digitisation! I could just sit on my sofa and uh, look from the home. And digitisation is changing humanity scholarship because it's changing how much we can physically go and see and the information that we can. I don't think it's changing the methods or the questions that we are looking, it's just changing the scale of them. So there's issues about scale, there's issues about speed. My own research, I'm more interested in what we can do with computers that we couldn't do before, but that's not to say that using these digital methods is part of a trajectory and it is changing the scope of what we can do because of the network society. 
So when I do something like look at census records, this was the first project I did when I joined UCL, the first new project. And we took the historical census records, we put them on high performance computing, we tried to do some analysis of them. Um, this is just part of a trajectory of trying to do quantifiable work in the humanities that goes back 500 years. It's not necessarily new. So digital humanities, as this kind of recent develop in humanities research, that's true, but it does have a history. These methods have a long history, and where you are now is part is an inevitable end to that history and an inevitable use for computing. Because it turns out when you look at the history of computing, People have been using those that for humanities research since computers were invented. So here we have the first computer. It's not even a digital computer, the differential engine. And Ada Lovelace, when she was writing her notes on the differential engine, she talks about music, she talks about literature, she talks about art, she talks about knowing human power, human consciousness. She realised that this analysis could not just be used for science and maths, and they called her a mad woman for it. She could sense that it was just beyond there, the, the power of this type of analysis and what we could actually do. I have a theory that if you look at any of the big computers, the digital computers that started being put into institutions in the 1950s and the 1960s, that you will find someone in the humanities looking at them and going, I could probably do something with that. That's going to be useful to me. It's true of Father Busa in Milan building an index of uh, Thomas of Aquinas' works. It took him 30 years, but he started it in 1959. It's also, and it's easy for the women to do it, he employed like 60 women at a time to do the punch cards. It took 30 years to make the punch cards. We've got a really nice project just now. We're interviewing a lot of these women that kind of worked for him in the 1960s and 1970s about kind of what it meant to be doing this stuff. Right? Um, but it's not just Father Busa, he's the one we've all heard of, but there are other people as well. Roy Wisby, in 1960, founded the, the um, University Literary and Linguistic Computing Centre at the University of Cambridge. So in 1960, there was someone else looking at Germanic texts. Again, the same history, looking back at quantifiable methods in the humanities. Now, looking at the computer going, that will make me do it faster if I can get my hands on that, and setting up a centre which looked at the history of language and, and linguistic analysis, um, which is still going today. When the first computer arrived in the 1970s, the artists from the art school were there, like a shop. What can we do to make this? And they kick-started the growth of computational arts. They set up the experiment, experimental computing department, and they were trying to break these computers that you wouldn't believe and try to output artworks. We have the first ever artworks produced by computers, uh, and, or printed out by computers in, in UCL. So you can see when a computer arrives, people do things with it. And my question to you today is, this is about the localization of this. What is your history then? What is your history for D.H. Benelux? What happened in the 1960s and the 1970s when the computers arrived? And I bet you there is a history there. I don't know it, but I bet you there's a history there and a trajectory there of people doing useful work with the mainframe computers when they arrived in, in the in the universities and it's important for us to know our own histories and it's important for us to realise that we're part of a trajectory both of methods and of application because that gives us strength when people say that we're new and that we're a flash in the pan and that we're going to go away again soon and we don't matter we can say oh wait a minute we've been here for a long time and there's more of us now and there's reasons for that which we'll come to in a minute but we are part of a, a trajectory. At my own institution um, you, uh, Susan Hockey was the person who gave me my first job, and she was really important in the 1970s, 1980s, thinking about text analysis, and it's been amazing to follow someone who was such a trailblazer in her field, and she hired me like the year before she was retiring, but to, to kind of come after someone who really took computers and turned them inside out and tried to do interesting things with them in, back in the 1970s for text analysis. You know, it's not a new thing that we're doing now. So when I look at uh, an iPhone, like text, uh, I look at like, an iPhone, we, we um, where Texel came from was me looking at this technology and going, I want to do something with this technology. This could be useful for the humanities. This is part of a trajectory of people looking at computers and going, yep, yeah, probably do something with that. So we built this iPhone app, which takes text analysis onto the iPhone to kind of be a public engagement tool. But it's part of a trajectory of using technology in the humanities. So we've shown that 
use of computing and the methods are not really recent developments for humanities research. But what has changed lately that made digital humanities suddenly explode in 2004? Well, firstly, we need to situate it into the global context. So what we have around that time is a massive increase in processing power of computers and the availability of computers. We also have a massive fall in the price of computers, so computers are becoming more available to everybody. We have a massive growth in network culture and the internet, so suddenly the internet is, is booming and also use of the internet is booming. So around 2004, that is the time where people go, actually there's enough people doing this computing in the humanities lag that it is a thing. There's enough people and there's more people using this stuff all the time. My reaction to this then is that digital humanities is inevitable. It was an inevitable birth of the field because it's the role of humanities to look at the past and present human record to understand human society, to understand human culture, <coughs> to make comments about the present society and present culture. So therefore, there had to be some people in the humanities that were looking at this computing stuff because of the changes that were happening in society. It might not have been called digital humanities, it might be called something else completely, but there has to be a movement within the discipline where people are looking at computing and are reflecting on it and are using it, are looking at the methods, are looking at the tools and are looking at the theory of what it means to be using this to question culture. Because if there wasn't, what are we doing? We're humanists, we're supposed to be asking these questions and we should be using all the tools which are available to us. The other thing about it being a recent development in humanities research is that it's just a rebranding. It's a rebranding of what came before. People were calling it cultural heritage informatics, people were calling it humanities computing, people will call it computing and the humanities or computing in the humanities. Lots of, you know, there, there are papers written about the difference between computing and the humanities and computing in the humanities, you know. Um, so it's this kind of rebranding of a term which really kind of means nothing and because the term doesn't have a very clear meaning it means that we can all self-identify as this kind of amorphous thing and we call it big tent digital humanities. Roll up, roll up, everyone's invited if you kind of do something with computing and culture and heritage and arts and humanities and museums and art galleries, whatever, you're all welcome, you're all there. It's a community of practice, there are enough people in it now that you will probably find like-minded people doing your same kind of thing. And there's a huge benefit in academia to knowing your community of practice and knowing other people. And that generally is, that for me, was the reason that I was going to ALC ACH 15 years ago, was to meet other like-minded people, because there wasn't very many of them about at the time. Now there are more people doing computing in the humanities. That's fine, but still we have this, this term which kind of means nothing. It's been a really successful rebranding. <coughs> if you look at Google Books and look at Digital Humanities with a big capital D and an H, people use Digital Humanities with a capital D. It's a proper noun now rather than a, just as a, a normal, you know, but it is a thing. Um, but this, this, the Google, Google Books thing is just a fancy version of that, right? It's just a fancy version of counting stuff. Google just have more books. They're not changing the world with their engram viewer. They just have more books to count than we had before. But what they do also as well, you can look at the trends over time in media, and, and digital humanities is now being mentioned in the media, the New York Times, the Financial Times, the Sunday Times, all the times, we're in all the times, digital humanities. I know it's been a big, big push, and a, there's now interest in what we're doing. We have to make sure that what we say to the media, we have to make sure that we demonstrate use to the media so people understand what it is that we're doing, it's another issue. There are books that appear. I am uh, responsible for a few of them. Digital Humanities in Practice and Defining Digital Humanities are my books. But ten years ago, there was one book in Digital Humanities, that reader. Five years ago, there was one book in Digital Humanities. But over the past three years, if you go into Amazon and have a look, there's, you know, there's 20, 30 books with Digital Humanities in the title. And there are many emails flying about from publishers who all want to get on the bandwagon. It is a bit of a bandwagon. These books are selling. They want to provide this stuff. I am not sure of the publishing situation here, so here's a question for you. Are, is there books that are emerging from this community? Here's another question for you. Should they be in English? Should they be in Dutch? Should they be, I don't know. I don't know enough about the, the, um, the politics of the kind of linguistic situation. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but we are producing 
this material now. So we are a thing. We can point to things and go, we exist because we have books, and we have books because we exist. It becomes a kind of virtual, virtual thing of people. I don't know if digital humanity is a thing. Here's the book, here's the book, it must be a thing. Um, so that's useful. We have journals, different journals. Um, the major journal in our field is uh, LLC, Liter or was Literary and Linguistic Computing. No, it's LLC, and it's now changing its name to, let me get this right, DSH Digital Scholarship in the Humanities. So it's going to be rebranding. This, this is a journal that's been going for 30 years. Yeah. 30 years. So, um, but we have other ones. We have uh, Digital Studies, which is short, unique. The interesting thing about this is um, this is the Canadian one. And they made quite a big deal of having it in French and English because of the Canadian political situation about language. Um, but I had a look yesterday. There's been not one publication in French in that journal. <laughs> Uh, or at least not one I could find when I was looking at the website, because I'm being recorded now and someone will write an angry email, but I did have a look and I couldn't find any applications of French. DHQ, we have, I am one of the general editors of that, free online open access journal. Um, again, we have only published in English, and we would be open to other people publishing to different languages, but it seems to be, you know, with this global thing, we're publishing in English. Um, I've already mentioned Digital Humanities Conference, so the ALC ACH conference changed its name to Digital Humanities in 2007, and we're having the 26th meeting, annual meeting, of, of the, the joint bodies under ATO in Switzerland just in, in three weeks' time. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. And it is a big conference. It's going to be 600 attendees. It's the biggest conference that we've had so far in digital humanities. You know, anyone who says digital humanities isn't a thing, all of this stuff exists. It exists as if we are an academic field, so surely we are an academic field. <laughs> and the growth in the places where you can come and talk about digital humanities is phenomenal. This is uh, Scott Weingart has done this analysis counting how many slots are available at conferences. Oh, did, oh, just, did I just put myself back to the fence? Sorry, I just touched something. Anyway, um, how um, we could, we have the chance to. to come to conferences like this. New conferences are happening all the time. So this is the one here today. Hooray, we're all here in DH Benelux. Um, but there are conferences like this happening all over the world. In 2010, I made this infographic, Quantifying Digital Humanities, and I got into a lot of trouble with this because people were angry that they weren't included. But what I did, you know, I tried to gather as much information as possible about the growth of digital humanities and put it into one place. And we showed that there were 114 centres in 24 countries in 2010 by 2014, so only three and a half years later, there are now 195 digital humanities centres in 27 countries. That's phenomenal growth. And if anyone who set up a, an academic centre here you knows how long it takes to do that, that shows the institutional benefits and the institutional support for digital humanities is growing. My own centre, UCRDH, has been going for four years now, only four years, and in that time we have been part of I'm not allowed to tell you how much money because we're being recorded. We've brought in a lot of money. <laughs> and uh, we have won four major academic prizes. We've published ten books between us. We, you know, a lot of success, a lot of success, a lot of um, features in the media, things like that. But you look at this and you go, there's no wonder other, ac other academic institutions are looking at centres and going, yeah, look at them, publishing the books, bringing in the money, featured on the news, you know, this is, this is the arm of the humanities which is reaching out to the general population and showing, isn't this cool, isn't this a cool thing, this is a cool thing. And we're getting a lot of response from that. So you can see why then centres become more popular. So how many people, how many people in humanities are now digital humanists? In 2005, Catherine Hales said, that, no, sorry, in the University of Virginia estimated that 6% of humanists were digital hum humanities. And in 2012, Catherine Hales said that 10% of people were digital humanists. But in a report that's coming out next week from Ithaca SNR, they're saying that 50% of people self identify as digital humanities, and the humanities, scholars in the humanities. 50% of people, and they have some caveats to that. They interviewed all of the scholars within f in four academic universities in the, the US, and a lot of the people were saying, yeah, I'm a digital humanist because I can use a wiki, or I'm a digital humanist because I can update my webpage, you know? So there's a whole trajectory then of tech and where digital humanity sits, and I do have some opinions on that. Isabel Galina, in her keynote last year, um, said, behind this problem of defining digital humanities, what we are and what we do, and if we exist, there's now an additional problem of who is we? Who are we? Who are we as a community? 
Communities have certain rules for growth and for communication. And if you go to the Digital Humanities Conference now, with these 600 people attending, that's a big community. When we went there 10, 15 years ago, you would know everybody who was there, the 100 people that were through the door. They would know but now it's too big, right? You just couldn't do that. But this is why we're seeing lots of local groups spring up, because it's important to know people, it's important to build up networks, it's important to build up contacts. So we have in Italy, the Italian Association for Digital Humanities, they had their first meeting in 2012. We have in Germany, it's not just Germany, it's the German Speaking Association for Digital Humanities. There was a big fight about that, whether it should be the German Association for Digital Humanities or the German Speaking. There's also people in Austria who speak German who want to join this. You know, so there, there are issues there with that. But they had their first meeting last year. We have the French, or the Francophone Association, so again, the French Speaking Association for Digital Humanities, and they're having a, a large meeting in Lausanne to all get together for the first time. Uh, we have in South America, we have Red DH, which is the South American Association for Digital Humanities. Some of these are aligned to ADHO, some of them are not. So ADHO, the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organisations. You know, we've tried to encourage everyone to become part of a wider network and tap into a wider thing, but some of them are going it alone, and there's very good reasons for that. Um, so this, DH Benelux, is just part of that trajectory. It's no longer two associations which organise a conference once a year. There's now lots of local chapters springing up. This is an analysis from the Francophone Association for, for Digital Humanities and they asked people in Digital Humanities what language they would speak at when they go to conferences and it seems like most people still at conferences in Digital Humanities are speaking English. Um, so even though they are the French Association, they show that most people are still speaking English at conferences and there's issues then with that for something like Digital Humanities. We put out the call for papers in 26 different languages we then had 10 different languages submitted and then we had to find reviewers for these 10 different languages. We had to find reviewers for Arabic and Farsi and things like that. You know, and this is, because of the size of our community, it's really difficult. So there's some issues there. We have to think about this uh, multicultural, multilingual things and, and how we're going to deal with that as a community. So I am delighted to be here with this, the recent developments in, in humanities research here in Benelux, but I just wanted to consider for a minute the benefits of having a local organisation. When I say local, I mean a smaller geographical basis for meeting, for having regular meetings, and what this can actually mean. People can see that this is a fragmentation of the wider community, and we can see that, you know, oh, not everyone's going to the same place every year and meeting, but actually there are just certain it's easier to, to meet up in a place and to make a local network, but there's also a lot of strengths within that. There's a lot of strengths to knowing the people in the institutions around you, to be able to respond then to opportunities that fly by, whether that's funding opportunities or media opportunities, or just hooking up research students with each other. It's uh, very important to know the local <coughs> people that are doing this. There's also power issues here. This again is from the French Association for from Digital Humanities who looked at the reviewers for, for Digital Humanities and where they came from and they showed that most of the reviewers in Digital Humanities were either from the UK, America or Australia. So there are issues about the powers within the wider Digital Humanities community and what we can do to support people that are not from the UK or America or Canada. Um, I have, we have, a, a local area digital humanities group, which I don't think anyone's ever really talked about before. We certainly don't even have a webpage. This is Bloomsbury in London, and we have a Bloomsbury group out for digital humanities, and that is anyone with the kind of, within the square mile of where we work, that we get together once a term. There's about 40 people, and we kind of get together, there'll be 20 people at a time, we have lunch, we have a chat. And what this means is that when funding calls come out, I know who to contact in the British Library or the British Museum. I know who to contact down at King's. I know who, you know, it's, it's standard academic networking, but we're making it work for us. And this is what this conference has to be for you. Academic networking, but making it work for you. And it is about then building up something which matters for you, which matters to your culture and matters to your heritage and being able to apply the digital methods and share the digital tools and the digital methods and building up links between different projects, between different people because you never ever know when you come to something like this the person you meet over tea is the person 
two years down the line who you've got an award winning project with. That's how it works, right? This is how it works. This local organisation, and I don't, I'm using the word local, I don't mean to be pejorative, it is, a, it is a, an organisation which exists because of certain geographical constraints, but that is fine. I think there's a lot of strength in that. I think there's a lot of strength in having enough of you together and making contacts and, and making good links between different organisations because when that phone rings, there's a funding call, you're there to, to deal with it and there's less scrabbling around. I'll also say something about um, strategic digital projects. One of the big, biggest su successes that we've had at UCLDH over the past four years is Transcribe Bentham. It is a project which you know we've won three or four awards for now. It has been on the BBC. It's been on the Sunday Times. It's you know it's a lot of public output, and this means a lot to my institution. It, firstly, Jeremy Bentham, who it's based on, is the kind of father of UCL. He is, it was on his principles that our institution was founded. We have his body in a box. He's on display, his head is in the archive. You know, it's a bit of a joke, you walk past Jeremy every morning, good morning Jeremy. Um, so he is a very totemic figure for my institution. And what we didn't realise when we started this project is that if the effect it would have on us all as scholars if it was successful. Because within a couple of years, everyone knew who we were. And everyone knew who the Centre for Digital Humanities was. And Everyone knew that that's what they do, and it was an example of, oh, that's what digital humanities is. All the stuff about whatever, but actually, this is, this is the kind of thing that they do. And it gave us a huge amount of strength within my institution, within the local vicinity. So we also now work with the British Library, who have some Bentham manuscripts. And it became almost a strategic thing that what you should do when you're starting up a local group is do something local that matters to your own community, to demonstrate the worth to it, but it, you know we didn't plan that really. It wasn't planned, but it has since become a very important thing for us as a demonstrator. This is what digital humanities is, and also as worth to the community, which are then going to be supporting us to allow us access to materials or to allow us access to internal funding. So my advice, if you're setting up networks and setting up things, build some pilot projects, which are local here that will look towards the archives, libraries, museums here, that only you can do, that only you can do. Do the stuff that only you can do. And that will then feed back and it will benefit you when it comes to asking for more resources, more other stuff or people understanding what it is you do or where you're coming from without having to give them the hour-long lecture about the history of the term digital humanities. So I hope today I've given a bit of a flavour of uh, where digital humanities comes from. It is not a new thing. Really, but what we have to continue to do is respond to changes in technology, to adopt them, to adapt it, and to question what it means to be using these computational methods to do something new, to do something interesting. We have to bring the humanities sensibilities into technology. So we're looking at methods, we're looking at what it means to be doing the computing, as well as building tools to help us search stuff. We're questioning technology and we're reflecting on it and I think that's very important to remember that that is the role of the humanist and that is the role of the humanistic part of the, the, the digital humanities in it. I don't think we're ever going to get an answer like what is digital humanities that pleases everybody but that's okay. It's a strategic development which binds people, it's a strategic term which binds people together and we should take that strength and take that strength of community and go forward and do good work because at the end of the day that's what we all want to do. I just want to say a word about social media presence and how important that's been to us as a centre when we've been getting ourselves established. So this is the Defining DH Twitter feed and we put stuff up there to, um, whenever it comes out over Twitter about, you know, people write blog posts all the time about what digital humanities is and we try and keep that up to date. But it's just an example of how important it has to be for us within an institution of um, having a really good web presence. And our centre has actually been commended within UCL as, as one of the people that know what they're doing. So now other people come to us for advice on how to set up stuff. So that then, we don't want to become a service. Don't become a service, digital humanities people. You don't want to become the people fixing the printer. No. But at the same time, um, we are the, we've got to walk the walk. You've got to show that what you're doing is up to date, cutting edge. 
that you know what you're talking about. And having a really good social media presence is important for that in this field. And Digital Humanities moves on, so I'm just going to finish by considering the future. Did the book, Combined to Digital Humanities, came out ten years ago. I wasn't in that book, why would I be? I was a PhD student at the time. Um, but the new companion to Digital Humanities, they're writing another one. The Revenge. It's coming out now. Um, it's coming out at the end of the year, hopefully. A companion to Digital Humanities 2. I don't really actually know what they're calling it yet. But um, they, it'd be interesting to compare and contrast how the technologies have changed during that phase. And I know that the book itself is considering different things. The last book went through the different subjects and looked at how they were using computing. And now they're looking at, at, at um, some of the more broader aspects which haven't been considered. So the technologies will change, the technologies will keep on changing. That's the nature of technology. The speed at which technology is coming at us is unparalleled at the moment. But it's our job as digital humanists to catch anything which is interesting flying behind the wind and try to apply it to the arts and humanities and do so in a way which is considered, do so in a way which reflects what it means to use the technology and then report back. So I'm really interested to see what a companion to Digital Humanities Benelux looks like. I'm interested to see the rest of the time that I'm here to catch up on the projects which are available here. But I think it's also useful for you to consider what led you to this point of meeting here today, what your history is, what your trajectory is, and then where you go from here as an organisation. And I wish you all the best in successful future conferences and future meetings and future networks and future strength working together as DH Benelux. Thank you very much.